Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Grover Poetry Workshop. My name is Carol Mankiti, and my husband was Ifani Mankiti, who died about three and a half years ago. But I, me and my four children inherited the store, and we are so proud of it because he felt it was so important to him. He loved it, even though his, he taught philosophy at Wellesley. But the, this, the poetry was very important to him. He thought this was a sacred place, and we honored that for him. He felt poetry was going to be the answer to the world, and I think in many cases it is. And we, I also want to thank, we're very blessed to have James as our manager. <laughs> You're here for a very wonderful reading, so enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Woo! through this book, Robert talks about why an assignment that started as one canto eventually became his translation of all of Dante's Inferno. He says, I had entered a difficulty I loved. Jersey Breaks tells the story of many loved difficulties. A town, a family, a profession, a neighborhood, more broadly an art, and a country. An earlier subtitle of the book, which is now Becoming an American Poet, was just Becoming a Poet. The word American is essential. It belongs on the cover here and in any description of Robert's work. Robert's poems tend to be kinetic and venturesome and acoustically intense attuned to the vocal interplay between vowels and consonants, and as indebted in their rhythms to 17th century English poetry as they are to American jazz. In them he sings, has been singing for 50 years, an American amalgam he first experienced growing up in an immigrant neighborhood in Long Branch. In Jersey Breaks, Robert talks about his reading as a freshman at Rutgers. This is about Ulysses. I set out to understand what Joyce's autobiographical character Stephen Dedalus means by saying that history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. I started trying to understand how the young Irish character's declaration might apply to my experience in the United States of America. William Carlos Williams, with his Spanish middle name and his English grandmother, Robert says, wrote poems brimming with mixed and mixed up immigrant cultures of New Jersey. Both writers, in different ways, led Robert to what would become one of the great subjects of his art, the quest for a democratic culture. He says, overriding every mere election and underlying every national abomination or achievement, I feel the tremendous compacted force, call it nuclear, of that enigmatic ideal, idealized duality, a democratic culture. As poet laureate, Robert sought to create a snapshot of American culture through the lens of poetry, not by talking to poets or professors, but by putting out a call to the citizenry, to cooks and students and construction workers and judges and accountants. Say aloud a poem you love and a few sentences about why. When we were working together on the project, Robert would sometimes say, Let's do this the Long Branch way. <laughs> Which meant you call a guy who knows a guy who knows something about wiring or bicycles or, in our case, fundraising. I'll tell a quick story that nods to Robert's, uh, Robert the high school C student rebel and, and one to Robert the poet wary of pretension. 
we were at a favorite poem event in Chicago, and my sister was there. And it was a screening of some of new favorite poem videos. Um, when Robert came in the auditorium, I said to my sister, watch. He, he won't sit in the chair that's assigned to him. <laughs> and sure enough, Robert walks in, sees his name on the label on the chair, like walks right by. <laughs> then he sees my sister, who he'd met years before, very briefly at my wedding, and he sits on down. <laughs> so um, that's the Long Branch way. You don't sit with the big wigs up front, even though you've got to get up and speak. You sit a few rows back with the physical therapist, mother of four, who's driven down from Milwaukee because that is your friend and co-worker's family. Um, here's a passage from Jersey Breaks about Robert's family name. Pinsky comes from a place, Pinsk, mostly Jewish, and the population mostly exterminated by Nazis. In my Berkeley years, Cheslav Mibos described Pinsk for me as he remembered it. He told me I mispronounced it. Pinsk had a river, a sawmill, but where I grew up, Pinsky with a short I was a local name. Dave's Bar, the Broadway Tavern, was across the street from Long Branch City Hall in the police station. The cops and politicians drank there, and in July, when the horses were running at Monmouth Park, so did many jockeys, trainers, and bookies. Lots of people were customers of both the Broadway Tavern and Milford S. Pinsky Optician. If I had a run-in with anybody, one of my father's first questions would be sort of Homeric. Did they know who you are? <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of people know who Robert is but not the way his father means, not the Long Branch way. Robert has written many books and won many awards. I'm not going to list. He was Poet Laureate, of course. He's done all kinds of fancy things, important things, some of them described in this book. But he also says in these pages, the highest and most essential amb ambition in poetry is that another person wants to give voice to your exact words. So in the spirit of the favorite poem project, I'll conclude by reading part of one of Robert's poems so that we can get to Robert. Um, these are the last three stanzas of the poem and the book, uh, Jersey Rain. The Jersey Rain, my rain, soaks all as one. It smites Metuchen, Rahway, Saddle River, Fairhaven, Newark, Little Silver, Bayonne. I feel it churning even in fair weather to craze distinction, dry the same as wet. In ripples of heat, the August drought still feeds vapors in the sky that swell to drench my state. The Jersey rain, my rain, in streams and beads of indissoluble grudge and aspiration original milk, replenisher of grief, descending destroyer, arrowed source of passion, silver and black, executioner, source of life. how I feel having heard Carol and Katie talk about Ifeanyi and then hearing that introduction from Maggie. I'm tempted to make the joke, but now I don't need to say anything. It's all been done. <laughs> um, Ifeanyi and Katie and I met when we were young puppies. We were two new professors at Wellesley College. And when Carol says Ifeanyi thought poetry was what the world needs, I think that was a bond between us. Um, Maggie's moving to me kind words about the book very much involved that idea, she quotes, that uh, improbable binary phrase, democratic culture. I think the bond I felt with my colleague and Igbo philosopher, student of philosophy, 
I think the bond was based on what I feel now is the subject of this book. I know that the retail category of the book is memoir. It's a memoir as far as publishers and bookstores are concerned. I think I have tended to use the word autobiography because the kind of ideas or aspirations Maggie was talking about and that uh, underlay the friendship with Fianni and my regard for Fianni and that I miss him and that being in this room makes me think of him. I think that to attain and actually perfect and enhance political democracy in this country that's not held together by blood or religion. It's obviously necessary to have a democratic society. If we can't begin to approach a democratic society, it's impossible to preserve anything like political democracy. It will go down, it will sink, and it is an open question. And to attain and perfect a democratic society, I believe it's essential to have a culture that is in some sense democratic. And we look to our ancestors, Duke Ellington, Mark Twain, Buster Keaton, Emily Dickinson, Willa Cather, Mel Brooks. We look to our ancestors to somehow make us feel we have a culture that is not inferior. It is it's not just our military power or our economic power that makes people around the world want to watch the American feature film, read the poetry of Whitman and Dickinson. And that sermon, which a mode I will not stay in, uh, is drawn out of me by thinking about Ifeanyi and hearing what Carol said and uh, then listening to Maggie. Uh, after that kind of lofty set of <coughs> remarks, which are from the heart, uh, if I were here, I'd been thinking, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I hope there's some jokes in this book. Uh, the opening sentence in the book is not a joke, but it does amuse me. And I think it may be the best sentence in the book and it was only kind of written by me. The first sentence in the book and the prologue is, given my background, a friend asked me, I can still hear her saying, Robert, you should write a book. Given your background, how is it I became a poet? rather than a criminal or an optometrist. <laughs> and it's true that my dad was an optician, not as lofty as an optometrist, but became partners with an optometrist. And his dad was a criminal. Uh, or as I quote my Aunt Thelma as saying, her pop, Dave Pinsky, he was in the liquor business, and it happened to be prohibition. <laughs> and I do quote, not every poet who writes a memoir can do this, I do quote from the New York Daily News, the indictment of my grandfather. Uh, he and uh, which Bruno and other colleagues of his, they were really the underlings, but they were indicted for what, I, I'm not, boasting about it, but the story did say the largest illegal stills in the history of pictures. <laughs> so I hope that counterbalances the sermon. And Maggie's exactly right about my relying on the long branch, the small town way of doing things. 
And um, the story I tell in the book is when the wonderful short story writer Lenny Michaels needed to send his, uh, his 11 year old to middle school in Berkeley, but the, Lenny lived in unincorporated Kensington. So Lenny and I went to City Hall and uh, I signed a form saying that uh, Jesse Michaels was my nephew and he was living with me on Monterey Avenue. Total falsehood. <laughs> And I narrate being at this Berkeley English Department dinner party uh, where uh, my colleagues, I knew there. I had known Lenny, but I didn't know many of them. And somebody says, Robert, it isn't true. It, did you lie on an official form for Lenny Michaels? <laughs> and people say, you know, it could, I mean, that could be, it could get you in trouble. And I did an accidental laugh line. I didn't know they were going to laugh. But I thought about Jersey Breaks. I thought about how you don't, you don't get in major trouble to help a friend, but that friendship is much more important than a any set of rules or laws. So if you can, you go with the personal loyalty, like Maggie's sisters there came to trouble to go to this poetry event we're showing these films and uh, I made that room full of Harvard and, and, and Yale PhDs laugh thinking about it. they said how could you do that Robert and uh, what made them laugh was I said quite honestly not trying to be funny I guess it all depends on how you're brought up <laughs> <laughs> and I was brought up that way I'll read, uh, I'll read a passage that I didn't think was one of the, uh, one of the passages that would be uh, readable at, a, at an event. And a friend of mine uh, pointed me toward this. And uh, I described living on the white street, rooming houses, Italians and Jews, a few Irish, right at the corner of the intersection of what was a mostly black street. And at the other end of the black street, Mammoth Avenue, was the Tally Ho Tavern, where the famous legend was a customer there had once bitten the finger of a policeman off. <laughs> and at our end of Mammoth <laughs> Avenue, across the street from the two-family house I lived in was Dr. Julius McKelvey, the black doctor. This much respected man in a three-piece suit who uh, was active in early years of the NAACP and he didn't succeed but he tried to integrate the Atlantic Ocean because the beaches in Long Ranch, one of the 12 or 15 beaches was black people could go into the ocean. Uh, our insanities. Uh, that adaptation, as distinct from waking up, like Stephen Dedalus, or as a form of waking up, that idea helps me think about real life quirks and paradoxes. For instance, Mammoth Avenue, with Little Egypt at one end, the dancer, and Dr. Julius McKenzie at the other, and of that short street. I can't pretend to analyze its history. As I'm not an intellectual historian, I'm not a sociologist, but I'm interested in these things. So I can't pretend to analyze its history beyond a misty, almost parodic, and that's one of those phrases, if he says almost, it means it's parodic, an almost parodic <laughs> sense of begets. The English class system begat dissenting Protestant settlers, who begat profit and enterprise. And profit and enterprise begat settlers, and settlers begat colonialism, genocide, genocide, and slavery. 
Slavery begat field chants and lynching, and field chants and lynching begat the blues, and the blues begat Duke Ellington, and Duke Ellington begat Ella Fitzgerald and John Coltrane, and Stan Getz playing Brazilian rhythms with Astro Gilberto, and the, and the Borscht Belt begat Margaret Cho and Chris Rock. Lynching also begat the Southern strategy of the Republicans. European emigration begat nostalgic yearning, and nostalgic yearning begat opera houses, and opera houses begat vaudeville, and vaudeville begat four-year-old Buster Keaton's father throwing his athletic little child around the stage, and East Coast correspondence begat and East Coast entrepreneurs begat Hollywood, and Hollywood begat Bollywood, long after it began the grown-up Buster Keaton, and the grown-up Buster Keaton begat Jackie Chan, years after he begat Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca. Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca begat Carol Burnett and Harvey Corman. In my own microcosm of poetry, T.S. Eliot begat Allen Ginsberg, who wrote imitations of T.S. Eliot and had erotic dreams about him. It's amazing to read in, in Ginsberg's journals. He, he has a dream where Eliot comes to him and tucks him in. And is, <laughs> when I first discovered Eliot and Ginsberg in the beatnik ambience of college, I read their poetry eagerly and thought the two poets were quite similar. Later, in class, I was taught that they were utterly different. A decade, or so, a decade or so later, I realized that they were quite similar, <laughs> another source of confidence. When I was very young in our Rockwell Avenue days, my family watched on television Sid Caesar's great parodies of operas and foreign movies, and we laughed at them together. Also, we were not only proud of Count Basie as a native of Monmouth County, we had his records. That is one piece of evidence for the Pinsky claim that we had good taste. <laughs> My parents are not college educated people, but uh, they, uh, they were sort of glamorous and uh, you know, we lived, my, my dad got fired when I was seven. We were living in a three bedroom apartment, uh, uh, two bedroom apartment, excuse me, two bedroom apartment with three kids and, and they swaggered nonetheless. I've been talking for about 20 minutes. Uh, anybody who knows me, even little, knows I could go on uh, with ease. And um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm glad to entertain uh, questions, kind remarks. Uh, if, if there's a part of the book or, or a poem that somebody would like me to read, as we say in the music business, I do requests. But, uh, I feel like I've, I've spoken a lot. I could speak some more. But now a little stimulus would do me good. And so, Will you read the part about the couch? The couch? The one Louisa threw away? Oh, in the Grolier. I'm hoping that you can tell me roughly what page that was on. I'm trying to remember. Otherwise, I'll have to paraphrase it. Okay. The oh, great. Oh, the Grolier Bookstore, I'll paraphrase it. If you find it, I'll read it. The Grolier Bookstore, when I, in the late 60s, early 70s, when I was a nervous, unhappy young poet with two children living in faculty housing in Wellesley College. The Grolier was a place I hated, hated to come to. Uh, it was run by uh, Gordon Kearney, who even people who liked Gordon said he was a slob. He liked upper class people, he liked being near Harvard, and there was a certain atmosphere in the store. It felt like a club. And uh, as I say in that passage that James is looking for, when I needed a book, I needed, I needed the new Elizabeth Bishop, or I needed an Alan Dugan. I would drive into Cambridge 
put my quarter in the meter, come in here, buy my book, and get out. <laughs> and uh, there was Gordon, and there were people who knew him well, and there was a couch right over there near the window. And on the couch, it seems to me, there always were Harvard boys wearing cowboy hats eating McDonald's. <laughs> and I was definitely not a Harvard boy. I didn't have a cowboy hat. And uh, I was struggling not to have to eat McDonald's. <laughs> and then, after Gordon died, this young woman, Louisa Solano, bought the store. She got rid of the couch. She put in shelves with literary poetry magazines on them. And the store, it somehow, the store got brighter, <laughs> mysteriously. And uh, so my nostalgia for this space uh, begins with the Louisa Solano years. Uh, and I think I'm probably unfair to Gordon Kearney and the people who were in the store then. I was probably too defensive and aggressive. Uh, but there we are. <laughs> and uh, then uh, it's probably the nature of many cultural institutions and things. At some point, my friends and I probably got to seem like snobs or, or, or too much in the place. But for me, Louisa getting rid of the couch was a great thing. <laughs> and uh, so my girl year is the girl year of Louisa Solano and then of the rescuer. Uh, the poet, the Igbo poet, Ifeanyi Mekidi. There will now be another question or remark or an awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a, a quick uh, remark. I, I find it endlessly uh, interesting to me that uh, sometime after I saw uh, you and Lawrence Hopkins perform home jazz, uh, too far from here um, with my wife Lucy who teaches at Berkeley and we both thought it was just phenomenal. It sort of really opened our minds and ours and we just you know, bought the CD and I started memorizing things. And I said to to uh, my wife and a couple other people, I said, now, now that I've learned, um, I, I so enjoy um, especially um, reciting horn and the green piano. The green piano is probably my, probably, probably has become my favorite poem. English language. Yeah. Um, and I just love, and I, and, I, and I said, you know, this is a crazy idea, but I'm going to send an email to Robert Pinsky requesting his permission for me to perform these two poems in public. And I can only imagine how much email Robert Pinsky gets in a day, considering how much I get in a day. Um, and, uh, and Lucy said, well, that sounds like fun. But just make you know, make it really clear that you're not asking for like you know for an endorsement or something, whatever. And so I thought I sat down and I crafted this little thing and made it clear that we knew a handful of people in common. And I actually got back this beautifully written email of within two hours. <laughs> and I and I and I was just totally you know and said you have but you know what a wonderful email for me to receive. You have my kind permission from you these either of these poems any time, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just flabbergasted. And uh, I mentioned to Lucy, and she just shrugged, and she said, well, no, no wonder he was a poet laureate for three years. He has his act together. Well, <laughs> you've, named, you've named two things that are <laughs> themes in this book and themes in my life. Uh, believe me, I'm capable of being rude to people. Uh, I'm, capable, <laughs> I'm capable of failing to, to respond times when I should. But two very powerful forces in my life have been communication and jazz. Hmm. And for me to answer an email that means something to me within two hours, it's kind of a family tradition and it's kind of ingrained in me. Somewhere in this book I say I was raised by expert joke tellers, complainers, liars, and arguers. And the use of language in all those ways was something that I was around. and. Uh, I like communication, and uh, as I say in the book, my first ambition as a teenager was to be a jazz musician, and playing the horn was the only thing I did well. I earned money playing it, I played gigs and made enough money to buy a really wonderful future aristocrat tenor saxophone. And, um, 
improvisation is essential to my way of composing a poem. Uh, it's like music, a lot of discipline and experience and study is involved. But like music, you study and subject yourself to discipline so that you don't have to think about it when you're doing it. You can do it fluidly and fluently and surprise yourself with it because you don't have to be thinking, what are my lines or what are the principles? You've done it enough times where you just are right at the feeling. You're just feeling it. Um, I suppose one thing I could do now would be to just read the poem. Uh, I do love working with uh, the wonderful jazz musicians like Lawrence Hobgood, Stan Strickland. Uh, the last time we did it, we had uh, the cellist, Catherine Bent, who's a wonderful improviser. And um, the poem, like a lot of my poems, it's an oblique, an autobiography that tries not to look like autobiography. Uh, the green piano really did exist. It was a piano. It was green. I'm vamping, sure that it's always been in this book in the past. <laughs> and it is on page 55. The green piano. Aeolian, gratis, great thunderer, half-ton infant of miracles torn free of charge from the universe by my mother's will. Piano, you must have amazed that half-respectable street of triple-decker families and rooming house house painters the day that the bowl anchored that the bowl-ankled, oversized hams of your legs <coughs> bobbed in procession up the crazy paved front walk, embraced by the arms of Mr. Puppick, the seltzer man, and Corridon, his black-skinned helper, tendering your thighs piano thick as a man up our steps. We are not reptiles. Even the male body bears nipples, as if to remind us we're designed for dependence and nutriment, past into future. Oh, Europe, they budged your case, its ponderous guts of iron and brass, ten kinds of hardwood and felt, up those heel pocked risers and treads, splintering tinder, angelic nurse of clamor, yearner, tinkler, dominator, oh, elephant, you were for me. When the tuner, Mr. Otto Van Brunt, pronounced you excellent despite the cracked sounding board, we obeyed him and swabbed your ivories with hydrogen peroxide. You blocked a doorway and filled most of the living room. The sofa and chairs dwindled to a ram and use, cowering. Now the colored neighbors could be positive. We were crazy and rich as we thought the people were who gave you away for the moving out of their carriage house. They had painted you the color of pea soup. The drunk man my mother hired never finished antiquing you ivory number, so you stood half done, a throbbing, mistreated noble, genuine, my mother's swollen livestock of love, lost one, unmastered, you were the beast she led to the shrine of my genius, mistaken. Endlessly I bombed, according to my own court system, humoresque, the talk of the town, what I say. Then one day they painted you pink. Pink is how my sister remembers you the Saturday afternoon when our mother fell on her head. Dusty pink as I turn on the bench in my sister's memory to see them carrying our mother up the last steps and into the living room, navigating and inaugurating the reign of our confusion. They sued the builder of the house she fell in. With the settlement, they bought a house at last. And one day, when I came home from college, you were gone, piano, mahogany breast who nursed me through those years of her concussion. 
and there was a crappy little Baldwin Acrosonic in your place. <laughs> Gleaming, walnut shell. You were gone, despoiled one, pink one, forever green one, white and gold one, comforter, a living soul. There's the book in another form. All of the same things are there. And indeed, democratic culture is there. The people in their carriage house, it's full of social class. All we had to do was pay for the moving. And my mom and dad hired Mr. Popic, the guy who delivered seltzer to us every week, and Corridon, his black-skinned helper. They took the piano apart, and they carried it up the steps, and we had a piano. We were lower middle class Americans full of aspiration and who were convinced we were as good as anybody. And that's the story of the poem and of my life. <laughs> yes. I wonder if a new platform of democratic culture is TikTok, which is also can be a miserable place. And I think about what sort of poetry fits there and some people put poems on this app and I wonder how you think these beautiful books and poems fit into the kind of interactions which are only 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Almost every medium and platform is mostly crap. <laughs> <laughs> the novel, which we now think of as a highbrow form, so aspired to, the novel was scorned as being for de written by depraved people for depraved people. The great poets studied by the English poets, Virgil, Horace, Catullus, they didn't write no rhyme. Rhyme was vulgarity. So I have no doubt, just as most television was crap, but there was Sid Caesar. The sitcom was crap, but Norman Lear came around and did something good with it. I have no doubt that on TikTok, I have the privilege of being old, so I don't have to pay any attention to it. But I have no doubt that most of it is contemptible bullshit. And that 17% of it is not bad. And between 4 and 9% of it is really excellent, is true art. And that's true of almost everything. That's the nature of the animal. We're a culture-making animal. And every so often, we strike gold. About between 4 and 9% of the time. <laughs> yes? Robert, you talked about some of the more formative friendships that you've had in your artistic career. Form I missed the mound. Sorry. Down because of formative. Friendships? Friendships that I've had. Maggie Dietz was very important to me. The favorite poem project, which along with my family and uh, my family and these books, my art, my family, then there's the favorite poem project videos. And uh, Maggie was essential to having those. Again, I think the Poet Laureate is a kind of bullshit title. But you can do something, as with all things, you can do something good with it. So out of that kind of preposterous, almost the synonym for mediocrity, given the list of the British Poet Laureates. But, but you could do something good with it. So that is one sterling example. Frank Bedart was an essential friend, my colleague at Wellesley, at the same time that Ifeanyi was. Uh, he was an amazing reader, an empathetic reader. He would, not how he would have done it, he somehow began to say how you would write the poem. C.K. Williams, Louise Glick, I've had poets I admire immensely who've been important to me in writing and now I'll read a passage of the book that involves another form of friction.
Here's another good sentence that I didn't write is coming in this passage. I married young. This is in the chapter called A Hat Like That. I married young. But for a few years before that, I did have the social life of a single person. One Friday night, a beautiful young woman and I were standing in the alley outside a club. I, I should include the information that I grew up in a nominally orthodox Jewish family. We went to the orthodox show in my town. A uh, beautiful young woman and I were standing in the alley outside a club. We watched a young orthodox Jew emerge from around the corner and walk past us. He was wearing the traditional ankle-length black overcoat and the fur hat called a shremel, the shape of a marshmallow, but black and nearly as wide as his shoulders. They're often mink, they're expensive. After he turned the corner, my date smiled at me and said, how come you don't have a hat like that? <laughs> So I give a wise guy answer, and she tops it. I told her that when the souls of Jewish men are waiting to be reborn, the angel in charge asks each one of us, which would we rather have, a splendid main stremel or excellent sexual equipment? <laughs> and my soul, I explained, had a hat like that the last time. <laughs> Your soul said Ellen Bailey. Never had a hat like that. <laughs> so I married her. Aww. That remark about my soul and the guy's hat was a landmark moment <clears throat> in what became our long marriage. She had the wit to see through my blather and to intuit my fearful worldly aspirations. Aww. So that's another answer to your question about uh, influential people. Maybe one more question. I think, I think we'll be in about the right. This better be good. <laughs> it's actually a request. I'd love to hear The Daydreamers, which I think is in that collection that you just read from. Is the poem The Daydreamers? Yeah. I'll I searched it up really quickly, and I think last. it's um, page 78. I think it's in at the Foundling Hospital. Do you um, know? I think. Um, According to this random Tumblr link that I found, I think it's on your selected poems collection. Okay. Yes, it is. It's fairly early. Now I remember. I want to read two poems. I'll close with two poems in this book. Um, The Daydreamers, page 78. The Daydreamers, all over the city, every person wanders a different city, sealed intact and haunted as the abandoned subway stations under the city. Where is my alley doorway? Stone gable, brick escarpment, cliffs of crystal, where is my terraced street above the harbor, cafe and hidden workshop, house of love, webbed vault, tiled blackness, where is my park, the path through conifers, my iron bench, a shiver of ivy and margin birch above the traffic, a voice, there is a mountain and a wood between us, one road, lovesick, where the late hunter and the bird have seen us, aimless at dusk, heart muttering like any derelict, or working all morning, violent with will. Where is my garland of lights, my silver rail? And I want to read another poem because an answer to the question about friends, uh, it's so easy to do something wrong. Gail Mazur, the poet and my friend, thank God, 
still living, still hopeful, still a friend. And Gail's husband, who died, I guess he died before Ifeanyi did, uh, but another death like that is a big loss to me. Um, Mike did the illustrations, the beautiful, amazing, monotype illustrations for the Inferno of Dante. And this is a poem, maybe an odd note to end on for you young, but we old are used to grief. It's not, it doesn't scare us at all. It's part of life. Uh, the poem is called Grief. And two friends come into the poem. One a kind of pain in the ass. That's Lenny Michaels, the one I told you who I signed the, uh, the false form for. <laughs> And the much nicer <coughs> one, who is in the second half of the poem, is Mike Mazur. Mm -hmm. And Mike and Gail have been very important friends to me as well. So I'll close with this poem, Grief. Grief. I don't think anybody ever is really divorced, said Lenny. Also, I don't think anybody ever is really married, he said. Because English was really Lenny's second language, and because of Yiddish and its displaced place in the world, he never really believed in his own prose. He wrote sentences the way a great boxer moves. Near the end, he told me, Robert, I'm in hell. Something Lenny might have said about hunting for a parking space in Berkeley. <laughs> Mike, too, was himself. His last month, too weak to paint or make prints. He sat and made drawings of flowers, ink attentive to the rhythms of beech rose, wisteria, lily, forms like acrobats or Cossack dancers. Mike had a vision of his body dead on his studio floor, seen from high above. He didn't feel sad or afraid seeing it, he said, just sorry for the person who would find it. You can't say nobody ever really dies. Of course they do. Lenny died. Mike died. But the odd thing is, the person still makes a shape distinct and present in the mind as an object in the hand. The presence in the absence. It isn't comfort, it's grief. Thank you all for coming tonight. Let's give Robert another round of applause. We have some books for sale. Nicole will be signing books. Thanks again for coming. If everyone could please move your chairs up against a wall, that would be greatly appreciated.